Yeah, we'll talk about Speaker of the House Mike Johnson and his porn habits as well, which is like a question one might ask. Why do we know about the the porn consumption or rather lack thereof of not only the Speaker of the House of Representatives, but also on top of that, the son of the Speaker of the House of Representatives is because he's volunteered this information. So... It's just like odd, an odd thing to talk about, an odd thing to mention. Okay, um, let's get started on this. I'm gonna immediately here. Getting pretty heated. Trump admonished by judge during the testimony. We're gonna start off with Donald uh, Trump today, the goat, our king. Okay, our king, the goat. He's fucking at it. He's doing the thing, doing the damn thing. That's right. My president. Um, here. I might need to I might need to take Kai outside real quick. This strategy is not only just going on monologues, it seems, from the stand somewhat, but also not even answering the questions, which is what has brought about this admonishment from the judge. Let me bring in David Challey and CNN's political director on this. And here's a quote for you, David, just showing, as Kristen was saying, how the legal and the political, uh, in terms of the campaign, they've become the same thing. Here's the quote from Trump. I'm sure the judge will rule against me because he always rules against me, says Trump. That sounds very familiar from what we've heard from the campaign trail. You hear it all the time in the campaign trail. And the judge, of course, as you guys noted earlier, said that's not factually true uh, to Donald Trump, who was on the stand there. Uh, you can't separate these two. This is uh, the dominant front runner for the Republican nomination and the currently leading candidate to be elected president uh, next year, uh, running against the incumbent uh, Joe Biden, according to recent polls. And, and, and yet he finds himself on this day in this courtroom, in this historic nature. And guys, I don't think it is uh, despite uh, his legal challenges that he is still maintaining this lead. I think it is in part because of them. We have seen Donald Trump be able to utilize his legal peril, his legal challenges as a fortifying force for Republicans. And that is what we see in all the public data out there, which is this fortified world of Republicans around Trump, both in the primary context and how that benefits him in a general election context, whereas uh, Joe Biden does not have that fortified force among Democrats. So these trials are playing directly into uh, his hands here. Absolutely. David, stand by. Let's get back out to the courthouse. Paula reed has got some more detail from inside. What's happening? This is getting pretty heated. Uh, the judge asking Trump's lawyer, quote, can you control your client? This is not a political rally. This coming from our colleagues who are inside the courtroom watching this live. Uh, the judge forcing Trump's lawyer, Chris Kais, to talk to the former president. The former president, uh, we're reading here, apparently waved his arms uh, at any suggestion of taking a 10 minute break. He is sitting back in his chair, we're told, just pursing his lips in that sort of classic Trump smile. Uh, Trump's lawyer is assuring the judge that their client, quote, understands the rules. The judge shot back and said, well, he doesn't abide by them. Now, apparently, they're back into questioning, but this is getting pretty heated. If there was any question about whether the former president could remain uh, composed on the stand, refrain from attacking uh, prosecutors, uh, the judge. Well, it's pretty clear. Uh, he and the judge sort of getting into it here. The judge is especially frustrated with Trump's uh, inability to focus and his lack of brevity. I mean, something that we've all seen many times with the former president. But when you're on the witness stand, it's different. This is not social media. This is not a campaign rally. This is the judge's courtroom, and he has repeatedly asked the former president not to engage in, quote, speeches or essays. It looks like they're continuing with questioning. They're not taking a break. And the former president's lawyer assuring the judge that his client understands the rules. All right, Paula, keep us posted because this is, as you said, getting interesting and getting heated and may come to a head soon. Ellie Honig, you know, this is now several times the judge has gone back and asking Trump's attorney, Christopher Kais, can you control your client? Yeah, I think it's interesting, by the way, that the uh, the judge is not 
directly speaking to Donald Trump, the witness, which he can do. Judges give instructions directly to witnesses all the time. What do you think is he's I think he's trying to create some separation, some distance. I think the judge does not want to make this Judge Angoran versus Donald Trump. And so that's why the, Trump, the, the judge is saying to Trump's lawyers, can you all do anything? Can you please yeah. control him? It's really important to understand the judge has fairly limited enforcement powers here. Usually the fact that there's somebody sitting up high on the bench in a black robe is more than enough to get a witness to comply, to listen. I mean, the courtroom's set up that way for a reason. But when you have a witness like this who is just dead set on it, you can admonish, you can warn, you can strike testimony, meaning take it off the record. But ultimately, that's really all that the judge can do. And so this will be an interesting dance here between the judge and Trump that 36 minutes in and it's already at, at a pretty high temperature. Absolutely. Well, there are some other statements that are coming out. I mean, they're, we're getting so much so quickly. I'm going to take a couple steps back to go forward because they're during questioning as well. It seems Donald Trump has hinted at what the future, the, their future defense, I guess, during this line of questioning may be. Um, this is full screen five or six, just for the control room, where Donald Trump says, um, when it comes to he says we're going to explain that as this trial goes along this crazy trial goes along because we're bringing in the bankers very big bankers they'll explain exactly what their process is they were not really documents that the banks paid much attention to they looked at the deal this kind of Jeremy Saland is with us as well this speaks to the facts and figures that need to that is part of this line of questioning that they're trying to oh. have and Donald Trump saying sorry she, I had to she had the PM and poop. Fuck. Holy moly. That was a lot. That he thinks that he's going to be bringing in big bankers to prove his case. I, I don't know what big bankers means. But, exactly. Uh, the, the, bo <laughs> the, 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 the bottom line here, this is playing all into the attorney general's hands. I mean, this is this is what they want. They're not here to debate politics and, and what's going to happen outside the courtroom and in an election. They're looking at the four corners of that courtroom and whether they can prove their case. And, and going on tirades and talking about big bankers and going after the judge does nothing for his credibility, does nothing to dispute the allegations, does not bring new facts and, and evidence into play. So all all this really hurts Donald Trump. And um, you don't bring me on to be a, a mental health professional, but I, I do wonder whether or not the former president understands the gravity of, of what he's doing. And I think also at the same time, he is more afraid of this case because he thinks that the other matters, he's never going to see a day in jail and it doesn't really matter. This is his name. This is his future. But he's, he's going off the rails from what we're hearing about inside the courtroom. All right, let's get back to uh, the courthouse steps. Caitlin Collin is there, it, it, and I understand, Caitlin, um, things have not improved inside the courtroom. Because they want to come to her. <laughs> no, they haven't, and it's not really. He did everything right. 385 deadlift is not, dude. What's your BW at? What? 385 deadlift for 10. 385 deadlift is not that high, but easily being able to put it up. Uh, for 10 on my top set is that's the impressive part in my opinion. Really that surprising but so much of it is how this is proceeding with Trump being uh, asked these questions not giving a direct answer certainly not in the judge's estimation of what's happening there and he is getting incredibly frustrated he just uh, removed some of Trump's comments from the records where Trump was bragging about how much cash he had the judge uh, essentially having uh, groaning here saying that he is not only being filibustered by the witness the former president who is on the stand right now but also he is saying by chris kyes trump's attorney who is in the room and the judge is getting uh, incredibly frustrated he has now admonished trump in the middle of his statement now that has happened i believe five to six times trump has only been inside that courtroom for about 39 minutes here and i think that is what's notable here is just how quickly this has devolved into a bit of a chaotic situation. What we do know is that the prosecutors don't seem to be getting into the middle of this of what's happening between the judge and Trump and Trump's attorney and instead are continuing with the questioning. I think one really interesting aspect of this is obviously what's at the heart of this is that Trump overvalued and inflated his assets to get more favorable terms on his loans. Trump is essentially trying to claim that actually these properties were under valued and that sometimes he questioned the values of what was on wait no she still has the rgb she just turned the light off i think somebody somebody told her how you can like i guess turn the light off on the rgb because like because 
you know, she's still keeping that she's still keeping that thing on her. Cuz honestly, as a real gamer, um Alina Haba knows <laughs> there's an opportunity for gaming everywhere. Okay? Gaming opportunities can strike at any moment, at any time. You know what I mean? Maybe there's a brief pause in the trial, you're going to pop off. You're going to fucking you're going to get on the queue. You can play a little bit of league, right? Um so I get it. I respect it. I use a Steam Deck for that purpose. Uh, but, you know, she's using, uh, she's using the ROG, which is uh, definitely way lamer. Uh, anyway, let's hear from Trump, though. What does he have to say about all this? They had no idea. They had no idea what the numbers were when they said $18 million for mar lago And it's 50 to 100 times that amount by any estimation. Someone said he... He said it's more valuable than the Taj Mahal. Like the the fucking <laughs> it's so sick. That that technically technically his uh the Mar a Lago is more valuable than the Taj Mahal. Like billions. It's actually valued at billions of dollars. Uh, they had no idea. They had no idea what the numbers were when they said eighteen million dollars for Mar a Lago. And it's 50 to 100 times that amount. Yeah. More Trump. Let's see what else he's got. I think it went very well. I think you were there. And you listened. And you see what a scam this is. This is a case that should have never been brought. It's a case that should be dismissed immediately. The fraud was on behalf of the court. The court was uh, the fraudster in this case. They made references to assets that were... Very valuable, and they said uh, they had no idea. They had no idea what the numbers were when they said eighteen million dollars for Mar-a-Lago, and it's fifty to a hundred times that amount. He is looking extra orange, at least on this one. I mean, this one is like Fox News making no effort to make him seem human at all, or maybe the hue, highlighting the hue because that's like that classic. Not a clip, but a quote. Aberdeen is the oil capital of Europe. Very rich, Trump says, at which point the judge interjects irrelevant. Trump adds softly, it is. As a single issue voter who supports Aberdeen being referenced as the oil capital of Europe at every possible moment, Trump has won my vote. I mean, he's just, he's out of control. He's, he's completely out of control. He is, uh, he's just pulling out all the Trump moments. Um, I feel like he must see the polls. He must be seeing the polls showing that like, he's actually comes during Brandon on, on, you know, important States. He knows, he knows what's up. He's like, it's time. It's time for me to get fucking unchained. Presser is live. Oh, we demonstrated that in fact he falsely inflated his assets to basically enrich himself and his family he continued to in persistently engage in fraud um, the numbers no one is voting for Trump law okay. brother you are out of your mind if you think nobody's fucking voting for Trump you're so crazy for saying that what the fuck is this anyway <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nobody's voting for Trump. Law, I say, in the year 2015. I don't know what's happening at all. I don't know what's gonna happen at all, but I'm sure ain't nobody's voting for Trump. I mean, that would be sh that would surely be crazy. Anyway, so the situation with Trump is is he's just doing classic trump shit obviously this trial is not as important this is more of like a lol you're humiliated trial rather than anything else liberals on twitter are starting the campaign of vote shaming for people who have made it clear they won't vote for biden yeah i don't really care i mean that that strategy has never worked i don't know why liberals constantly do this like failure of a strategy instead of triangulating and instead of, like, making concessions, 
and and listening to the demands that people who would otherwise vote for the Democratic Party and like what their expectations are out of that vote. Uh, liberals have already run the um, our deeply unpopular candidate. Might not make it. Well, fuck you. Uh, it's your fucking fault. So, I don't know. The finger-wagging strategy just doesn't work. And at a certain point, at a certain point, something's got to give, right? Something's got to change, but who knows? Like, I don't know if Brandon will lose. I, I, I'm not saying that he 100% is going to lose, right? But... It's just so weird that they constantly fucking hit the same shit over and over again. Now they're blaming TikTok. Biden aides say they're paying attention to Democrats' growing generational divide over backing for Israel, pointing to the support they have provided to combat anti-Semitic incidents on college campuses. But they are also warily monitoring developments like how the Chinese government-controlled TikTok algorithm just happens to be prioritizing anti-Israel content on the social media platform preferred by many under 30. They see the poll numbers... And they see that under the age of 44, under the age of 44, all of a sudden there's this massive generational shift. Not recognizing that those who are under the age of 44 have only seen tremendous amounts of bombing campaigns conducted in an open air prison that Israel controls. Uh, and therefore, perhaps they might have uh, an opinion about it. Like a lot of these people developed consciousness. At, at a time when, you know, Israel was finally considered an apartheid state. People pay attention to that sort of thing, you know? So, um, it's also kind of giving the game away where, like, well, mainstream media controls the steady flow of information and it has the capacity to manufacture consent, but all of a sudden, when uh, you have, a, you have a, a, a social media platform that's not, like, entirely controlled by State Department interests, like, well, lo and behold, people... Uh, People get to see that, and they get really frustrated about it. I've talked about this quite a bit. Uh, I talked about this at length with uh, Dave Weigel of Semaphore, formerly of Washington Post. Um, this is a question that a lot of people who are over the 44 uh, age cutoff are, are trying to figure out. They're like, how the fuck is this happening? How in the ever-loving fuck is this happening? Um, why are people so differently, like, why are people viewing Israel from a completely different lens? And, um, I've tried to explain to people and including Ben Shapiro, who I replied to today, he said, the goal of legacy media, political leftists and Hamas is to lie about Israel's military strategy in order to create a re retroactive moral equivalence with Hamas's mass murder of civilians. That's why Hamas is trying to get Palestinian civilians killed. To which I said, he'll never understand why the dam is breaking and will point the blame at anti-Semitism of the media, not doing enough passive voice when describing Israel's bombings. Like, I don't know how else, I don't know how more aggressively the media could, uh, could try to contextualize the unimaginable amount of violence that Israel is subjecting Palestinians to. Like, just so cruel and so unusual, right? Like, what do you want them to do? They, li they already fucking literally have an IDF spokesman immediately as soon as the bombing campaign is being conducted. Before they even, like, pull out the babies out of the rubble, you have an IDF guy being like, yes, these are children, they deserve to die. Here is why. Um, and, um, and, and here's the real reason. I'll tell you what it is. You can't kill 10,000 civilians, most of them women, children, and the elderly, in 30 days. It's that simple. You can't do that. Y you can't. That's it. It's that simple. You can't just like fucking literally be like, sorry, we lit this orphanage on fire and blew it the fuck up. And here's why you think that's actually great and expect people to go. Okay. Yeah. If you have lived an entire lifetime of that kind of information, when you've never actually seen the Palestinian side, when you are also trained, when you're also conditioned into uh, thinking that Palestinians, Arabs, Muslims in general are are not really human or whatever. Okay? Yeah, you will have overwhelming support for our Western partner, the only democracy in the Middle East. Do you believe the theories that Jews control the U.S. media since a lot of the owners are Jewish? First of all, that's a ban. Second of all, that's anti-Semitic. And last but not least... 
and much of anti-Semitism, when it's not like a, a, a gross bigotry, is also entirely stupid. Uh, no, I don't believe that the Jews control the media. You fucking idiot. I believe, however, that America has a interest in maintaining Israel uh, in, in the most violent means possible because they like that Israel is a destabilizing force in a resource-rich region. They like having an unsinkable aircraft carrier. They like having an entire network of an entire network of, of espionage agencies that they can utilize. That's the same as controlling. That's really okay. That's another ban. No, it's not the same as controlling. America controls Israel, not the other way around. You are literally out of your fucking mind. There are those inside uh, the, the Israeli government that have uh, truly violent interests, right? Truly. We've covered many of them. We've covered their takes. We've covered uh, all the fucking ridiculous shit that people have been saying, like, you know, melting Palestinians and, and even maybe nuking Gaza. Okay? However, the real... The reality of the situation is that America controls how aggro Israel can be. Okay? That's it. So, one thing to always consider is that everything that is happening in front of your eyes are happening with the go-ahead of the United States of America. I've been watching a lot of your old stuff. I feel like you've changed a bit for the better from this war, and I feel like that goes a for a lot of people. No. Everything that I've said about uh, Israel and Palestine has, has been consistent for the past 10 years, I would say. The only difference is that, like, I uh, originally was a believer in the two-state solution until I recognized that the two-state solution, much like others, much like many other scholars from Avi Shlem to, uh, to, to, you know, the Palestinian advocates that have been uh, advocating for a one-state solution since, like, 1969, um, I, I recognized that there, the two-state solution has just been championed by those who maliciously want to maintain the apartheid structure with no real interest in, with no legitimate or real interest in, in offering uh, Palestinians emancipation. As a matter of fact, over the course of the past couple of years, many people uh, who have been advocates for Palestinians have also come to that same conclusion as well. So I don't see any solution that isn't possible without a third party help like other nations in the UN. Oh, of course. Of course. Yeah, I'm, I mean, obviously, yes, you, you must have international uh, enforcement, not even cooperation, enforcement. 100%. <clears throat> Anyway, um, I talked about Bernie Sanders yesterday. I don't, um, I don't know what else to say about it. Are you considering the possibility that you're only using facts that you know and overlooking deep, dark facts that you are not yet aware of and malicious things that people may never know? All right, what's happening today? There's a lot of gray name Nazis in the chat. What's going on? Do we need to, do we need to increase the, 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 the ban rate a little bit, I think. Brother, for the past 10 years, I've been tackling all of these, like, just asking questions, uh, just curious Nazis. Um, it is uh, completely antithetical to my worldview. Not only is it gross and immoral and a hate crime, but it's also completely antithetical to the way I view the world. You can just ask, yeah, you can jack off as hard as you want, but you're not going to make any kind of, like, uh, you're not going to be able to penetrate this uh, community with uh, idiotic assessments of the situation um, because, you know, it doesn't correspond to how the world actually works. Dumbass is coming in here and being like, well, don't you think, like, maybe the protocols of Zion? Like, I mean, I'm just saying, like, yeah, maybe the Tsarist Russians had a good idea on, you know, what to do with the Jews or whatever the fuck. Shut the fuck up, okay? 
You did it on bands and pretty sus offenders in the last banana peels. Yeah, no, not a, not a single one of them was like has been represented so far. Anyway, so none of this, of course, means that like Trump is going to be better on Israel Palestine. Of course not. Trump is the reason why we're in this situation to begin with. It, it's actually one of Biden's worst. Uh, worse initiatives was to continue uh, Donald Trump's uh, normalization agreements between Israel completely sidestepping the Palestinians and and very arrogantly, um, very arrogantly sidestepping uh, the Palestinians and their plight and the ongoing occupation to develop uh, more formal relations with the Gulf states in the region. Um, these Gulf states have almost always had, uh, maybe not on paper, but almost always had a decent relationship with Israel for the past couple of decades. This is simply, um, this is uh, simply to put it on paper. Now, of course, the way that uh, the way that this works is is uh, the Gulf states cannot maintain uh, an authoritarian structure if there is an overwhelming amount of their population ready to fucking rise up against them, which is precisely the reason why uh, this uh, the actions of October 7 make it impossible for uh, Gulf states to continue with their Abraham Accords, even though uh, the Saudi kingdom has said that we will continue with the normalization after everything is quieted down, after everything has died down, um, the uh, Saudi Navy has also been working to intercept uh, missiles, uh, Houthi missiles coming out of Yemen and going into Israel. So they are, they are of course, continuing their collaboration with Israel. Um, these are things that are important to understand. <coughs> but yeah, um, before we get to like Donald Trump's uh, uh, edge... Uh, poll uh, poll numbers and, and uh, the edge that Donald Trump has over Joe Biden. Let's get to the massive amount of protests that happened all around the country. They descended on Washington by... I don't know why these have the Golan Heights in them. I think uh, a lot of these uh, well-intentioned Zoomers, <laughs> I guess they don't know. They're kind. They're well-intentioned. <laughs> that's not... That little tippy-top part of that, that's not supposed to be uh israel or palestine that's that's syria that's like uh, illegally annexed syrian territory um the reason why people use watermelon as a symbol is because it's the same colors of the palestinian flag and when you're not allowed to uh when you're suppressed and you're not allowed to show the palestinian flag because it's like considered a symbol of terror people used to use uh, watermelon the tens of thousands pro palestinian protesters from across the united states some traveling thousands of kilometers by bus to reach the gates of the white house to deliver a message to the american president shame on you go to hell that's what i would say if you're a human you should care the protesters' demands were threefold, a ceasefire, an end to the siege on Gaza, and an end to U.S. military funding for Israel. A cross-section of Americans came. Yeah. Many were Arab, and many were not. Besides being a Jewish American and a veteran, it's important as a human being to be here, to care for children, to care for the people in Gaza. On this day in Washington, the support for Gaza stretches as far as the eye can see. But the question is, do these protesters represent the greater American public who, according to... That's a great question. The unfortunate answer is, if you look at the actual polling on the matter, no, most Americans either A, don't give a shit, or literally fucking uh, unconditionally still offer support to Israel by massive margins. A lot of you may look at Twitter and and think that that is like whatever your algorithm shows you is like actually consistent with the way that Americans feel. That is not the case, okay? But every single person who has been advocating for Palestinians for uh you know years and years will tell you that there has never been this much. There has never been this much broad support for Palestinians in general. So. This movement is in its beginning phases. The dam seemingly is breaking. But of course, there is a, a long way to go. 
I always get very upset when I see like a dumbass neoliberal uh, fucking Twitter account that I watch to like piss me, piss myself off. Uh, go, actually, Twitter is not real life. Like no opinion. They're like, oh, actually, Twitter's not real life. It seems. Look at these polling numbers. They offer unconditional support to Israel. It's like, yeah, dude. Everybody fucking knows that. Like, what? What do you mean? You're the one who just found out about this. You're the one who's telling on yourself. You're the one who's saying, oh, uh, everything I've seen on Twitter is, like, so different than, like, what Americans actually feel about Israel. It's like, yeah, no shit, stupid. Of course. Of course. Have you seen what the media does? Have you seen the way the fucking media covers Israel's actions? Yeah, no shit that, like, people that universally get their information and still have, like, some level of trust in mainstream media uh, are, are unconditionally going to support our fucking ally their entire lives, they've never even thought about it. And when they have thought about it, they've only thought about it as it's a, the only democracy in the Middle East fighting against our united enemy, the Arabs. Yeah, there was no fucking CNN or Fox here, if, as, uh, is, is what I understand, by the way. I did not even see, like, did they even cover this? This was a massive fucking protest. Did they actually cover it on, on uh, American outlets, on Western outlets? It seems like they didn't really do that. Yeah, it's a it's a rehash of like uh, the anti the the anti war protests uh, in the lead up to invading Iraq. It's just like the same shit, mass suppression, mass deflections, making it seem like these people have ulterior motives, making it seem like these people want to harbor the enemy. It's just really really fucked up. It's really fucked up, but they can't they can't if you don't. If you don't stay quiet, they can't ignore you. They can't ignore you for uh, as as long as they want to. They, they she's like this this damn will break. Anyway, huh. CNN was too busy covering war crimes from the idea of inside Gaza. What is this? Someone asked. Uh, someone asked. With the B, with the BLM movement, where where fuck? I missed it. That was a good question. But I, I, I can't find it. Hold on. You said the same thing about BLM, how the tides turn and something that was once radical can become mainstream. Free Palestine is the same. Yeah. However, with Black Lives Matter, uh, the mainstreamification of BLM also came with the commoditization of BLM. It turned into, it, it was effectively neutered. It was destroyed as like a radical movement, right? The, the difference is, even if it was like, even if Free Palestine was radically neutered and was considered broadly acceptable, considering the conditions on the ground for Palestinians, that would still be a, um, that would literally still be a, a benefit. It would still mean that you can freely say these sorts of things without suffering serious repercussions. Um, no, Dior did not replace Bella Hadid with an Israeli model. Please stop fucking uh, jumping on everything that you see online that has uh, more than 50,000 likes, okay? Um, it's like not even a new rumor. It's been around for a very long time. Longer than the top of the hour ad break has been around on this broadcast, I'll tell you that. Another major difference between BLM and Free Palestine is that Trump was president and BLM was used primarily as a cudgel against Trump racism despite its origins under Obama. Yes. What are my predictions for the future here? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I legitimately, I genuinely don't know. Um, it does feel like uh, this, is, this is not a time to stop. This is a time to keep pushing. Um, I, I think it's important to do that. It's important to keep yelling loudly and proudly that Palestinians deserve emancipation, this occupation must end, and that our hands are bloody in this conflict, in this matter, in this ethnic cleansing campaign. Like, it's, it's very, um, it's just very different from how things were five years ago, six years ago. You know what I mean? It's like Lennon said, there are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen. 
Do you think the free Palestine movement would be more popular with liberals if Trump was president defending Israel's genocide? Yes, it would be. Absolutely. I, I do believe that. Yes, it would be exactly like Black Lives Matter. Not that it fucking matters because um, in this situation, like part of the part of the momentum was built under Donald Trump. Under Donald Trump. Yesterday you were asking if there's anything floating around in the media that upset you. Yeah, I've already watched this. It's, it's very upsetting. But not even because it's, like, triggering or frustrating or anything. Like, I get very frustrated when I see someone... I get very frustrated when I see someone saying, like, incredibly unhinged shit, right? I get very mad when I see someone quote tweet, like, Rashida Tlaib, for example, to tell her what... Uh, what an emancipatory slogan that Palestinians have used for fucking, you know, 56 years, uh, what it, what that actually means. And there's some sinister hidden meaning actually. And that she alongside others are actually secretly saying we need to, we need to genocide the Jews. Like that's what the real reason is like that triggers the fuck out of me. This on the other hand is like a nuke. Okay. This is like a like a nuclear bomb went off in my brain. It shut my it shut my brain off when I watched it. And I don't understand how SNL being incredibly cringe still fucking clears this program. <laughs> Colombia anti-Semite. Hi everyone. We are live on YouTube with Colombia anti-Semite news. We're Everyone is welcome. LGBTQH. H. Hamas. <laughs> yeah, I totally sim Hamas. Yeah. It's so trending right now. From the, the river, river to, to the sea, Palestine, Palestine will, will be free. free. Do you know why it's true? Mm. Because it rhymes. <laughs> Just look at all this toxic Zionist propaganda. Kidnapped in Gaza? Does this look like Gaza to you? Yeah, bro, I have no idea what Gaza looks like. And they're smiling. Do hostages smile? Sign us liars. Totally sus. Do they think we're stupid? Stupid? I major in queer post-colonial astrology. Ew. I love the... I love the, 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 the actual, like, legitimate... Uh, a distaste for like queer presentation in general that just seeps out of this too you know what I mean like it's supposed to this entire sketch is supposed to signal to the world like well look at this classic contradiction like Hamas they would kill all the gays right they would kill all the gays that's what they would do and all these dumb gay people in America are defending Hamas. They love Hamas. They're supporting Hamas. Okay? Because they're so stupid, right? Like, it's the classic... It's the classic uh, chickens for KFC moment, right? Now, um, it's obviously ridiculous. Solidarity with uh, people who are subjected to cruel and unusual punishments should not be on the conditions that they agree with you you should have a moral backbone that goes beyond that uh i guess for reactionaries in general i guess for reactionaries in general this is like an unimaginable concept because for them they're like you know what do you mean i only defend people who defend me immediately like there's that's it um secondly the, so the, it also makes it seem as though like Israel's solution to the gay Palestinians is better, which is to fucking eviscerate them with bombs. Right? Someone is crying behind me a little bit, which is annoying me, but going to be okay, I think. Yeah. Oh. Jews make the world dirty. Yeah. And no, I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm racist fluid. Exactly. And now for a little break from all this activism, we want to say hello to our BFF. Bestie freedom fighter. Abu Fatwa in Gaza. Salam alaikum. Alaikum assalam. And inshallah, Allah will kill you all infidels. Thank you so much for joining us. Love the headpiece, the all oppression chic. Very drip. Mr. Fatwa. 
How are you? Are you safe? Oh, yes, I'm safe. I'm in a tunnel under the Gaza hospital. Oh. Above me, I have Allah and two million civilians protecting me. Community is so important these days. Do you need, like, humanitarian aid, food, fuel, medicine? It's okay. I have everything. I'm only hungry for rockets. Mm. As long as it's organic. Yeah. I wish I just could be there with you. You can. You can come to Gaza anytime, and we will throw you from the roof. Yeah, sick, dude. Fucking, yeah, exactly. That's, like, that's what's going on. Stop this, please. No, you need to watch this to, to develop a better understanding, okay? Liberal comedy is very important. Liberal comedy is very important to, to, under, to unlock the consciousness of, uh, a, of an entire population. This shit is so fucking gross. A screenshot of these losers in this video will be used for years and years. A disgusting reminder of it. I can see it now. Yeah. This is an SNL, thankfully. Yeah, no, it's just a projection of their pure, unadulterated racism. Um, so that's number one. It, like, I mean, it's not even funny, though. That's the problem. Because I don't think you can, like, get this racist and be funny at the same time. It's just, like, it's not happening. This is, like, two steps from SNL would do, no doubt. Sure. But many Americans will look to this and recognize that this is literally, literally, like a, like a Steven Crowder sketch. It's just so bad. Also, it's literally making the point that the blockade does not harm Hamas at all. I mean, there's so many different, there's so many different, um, so many different avenues to tackle this, okay? Yes, this was made by the Israeli SNL. Yeah. Um, by the way, the Columbia Law Students for Palestine group wrote for the Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch for over a decade advocating for the recognition of the Israeli apartheid. We worked super hard. Al Haq was our partner in Gaza and the West Bank. Sorry for the spam, Habibi. Yeah. Oh, I'm proud of you guys for pushing. And it and, and then the dam broke on that end. But it's odd because it's like Yeah, it's been posted by the Israeli government. Why is it in English if it's the Israeli SNL? Um I why was it it made in English? What do you mean? This is literally for guys. At one at what point will you recognize that Israeli propaganda does not have to exist for a broad majority of the Israeli population. Israeli propaganda has to exist for the Western world because without the Western world's unconditional support, without, for example, without, for example, America constantly fucking vetoing any kind of UN Security Council uh, uh, commitment or condemnation, um, you know, Israel would be... Is Israel would not be able to behave in the way that it does. This is something that you have to understand. Settler Night Live is crazy. Yeah. If there was a sketch comedy TV in the 1930s, the Nazis would have been doing shit exactly like this. I mean, I think they did, did do that. You know, there, there probably was shit like You homosexual dirt. Do you hear? Bro, want to throw me a rooftop party. They are so um, I feel like saying this is Israeli SNL is anti-Semitic to Lauren Michaels. <laughs> I mean. So welcoming and inclusive. So shukran. And you are also very welcome to come here to America. Uh, we will come. First we finish with Israel. And America is next. I love this. He's like, we're going to fucking come to America. Like, we're going to finish Israel and then we're going to come to America. Like, Hamas is going to attack America, dude. Great. So I guess we'll see you soon. Yes, it will be a blast. <laughs> Can't wait. It'll be so multicultural. Yeah. They managed to hit all the talking points. Yes, this is not like... Who would laugh at this? Extremely racist people. Like, incredibly racist people. In order for this humor to work for you you have to have the exact same positions as these people and and maybe even more racist than they are like you have to literally be you have to be in the in the in the intersection of like just enough homophobia just enough resentment for college campus activists and and of course a metric ton of islamophobia in general to be like 
um, to, to, to look at this and go, this is fucking hilarious. To me, it's like the grossest offense of this is that it's not funny. You know what I mean? How is it racist? They're talking about terrorists, not Palestinians. Come on, brother. Come on. Come on. Like, come on. Come on. You have you have a, a, a dude here. Be, like, this is such a this is such a Sam Harris 2004 take. Like, I feel like I'm about I I feel like I'm getting whiplash. Like, uh, you're one step removed from being like, uh, actually, Islam is a religion, not a race. Like, I have to, I have to go back to like the same fucking two decade old arguments about how like Islam, Islamophobia is racialized, and how. Like, for example, my name is Hassan, but most people, if I didn't know what my name was, would not perceive me as, like, a Muslim person. Whereas, like, the first victim of Islamophobic hate crimes in, uh, in the aftermath of 9-11 was a, a, a Sikh person. You know what I mean? Like, all this shit. Like, do we have to work through all of this, really? Like, you were that hardwired to, to jump to this? Like, the notion that Hamas is coming to America is fucking ridiculous. Brother, that's a 2023 Sam Harris take, too. I know, Sam Harris hasn't even, like, uh, switched it up. He's eating good. Ya Allah, you are so stupid. Thank you so much, Abu. We love you. I won't even bother killing you. It's a waste of bullets. Good vibes only. Uh, it's better you just kill yourself. <laughs> okay, bye. Die. <laughs> Die. This is Ahmed the dead terrorist, bro. Like, straight up. You're a fucking dumbass if you literally look to something like Ahmed the dead terrorist and go, what's Islamophobic about this? Like, what's anti-Arab about this? That's just a terrorist. That's not a human. That's not like Muslims, dog. Comedian defends Ahmed the Dead Terrorist puppet routine against the South African ban. Nice. Funny man, ventriloquist, Jeff Dunham. Like, how do we have to... What is going on? Someone is bored. Someone is bored. The polls at the beginning of the war were 5 to 1 in favor of Israel. <laughs> Recent major polls found more than 70% of Americans now back U.S. humanitarian aid to Gaza. We got to be anti-immigration and anti-Muslim because they're allegedly homophobic and misogynistic as if white Christian right-wingers aren't. I remember that shit back in 2014, 2016 era. Yeah, this was like, this was like super aggro, uh, super aggro Islamophobia. Um, that's what I wanted to see. I wanted to see uh, the, the Sam Harris interview, which we will look at, we will cover. So, Ahmed, we've been going all over the place. Well, yeah, you know where we are? Well, we are going so many places, I have lost track. And uh, we, uh, uh, what's with all the Jews? <laughs> we're, we're in Israel. <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah, okay, Israel. Yeah, but, yeah that's really funny. We're, what? <laughs> we're, in, uh, we're in Tel Aviv. As in Israeli army. <laughs> Holy crap. Well, I'm already dead. What the hell? Um, anyway, so yeah, uh, there you go. That's like I exactly the same energy of being like, what's, what's racist or Islamophobic about that? I don't understand. Okay, now we know who finds that earlier sketch funny. I mean, a lot of Americans did. Boy, boy, put this on my timeline. It's pretty upsetting. What is this? Sam Harris became pro-Palestinian. He absolutely did not. Oh, this. The river to the sea. That means you want to kill me. From the river to the sea. Ah. That means you want to kill me. From the river to the sea. That means you want to kill me. It's wild because, like, 
like this this type of shit unironically in my opinion works as hard against any kind of Hasbro operation as uh, as does like Israel's own personal actions so what do I mean by this right what do I mean by this what do I mean by this okay here's what I mean by this First of all, this, like, betrays the notion that this is, like, a very dangerous prospect. That, like, you want to kill all Jews when you say from the river to the sea because you're doing it, like, in the show tunes voice, right? So there's that part, okay? Secondly, it's so, it's so fucking cringe. It is so insanely cringe. And it works in the exact same way that, like, Israel's endless bombing campaign works. Where it's like, you can't... You can't keep killing children, okay? You cannot keep killing children and then expect people to not go, hey, man, maybe you should stop killing fucking children. Like, that's, it seems kind of crazy that you're killing so many children, right? Like, there is no, there isn't enough propagandizing that even mainstream media could do that, all of a sudden makes normal the murdering of 10,000 people in Gaza, the overwhelming majority of which is women, children, and the elderly. I think it's like 73%. So when you do that, when you keep doing that, yeah, people are going to be like, listen, dog, this is fucked up. Especially because the only way to do that is with Western support. You can't do it on your own. Like, if you did it on your own, the money faucet would dry up real quick. Like, you think Israel's economy could withstand 300,000 reservists and an endless bombing campaign and an iron dome for defense, too, on top of that? No. Yesterday, CNN's Jeremy Diamond went into Gaza on an IDF embed. I should note that journalists embedded with the IDF in Gaza operate under the observation of Israeli commanders in the field. And Understand, CNN is now allowed to film stuff inside of Gaza as an embed with the IDF. And if, if they are embedded with the IDF, the IDF gets final cut approval over whatever footage they show. That is insane, Okay. Like, that's, that's the kind of shit, first of all, across the board, that's the kind of shit that you're not supposed to do for the American military. But, of course, we've moved far beyond honesty and truth in journalism. <laughs> like, that's not even an expectation here, right? That's not journalism. Like, you're not doing journalism at all. You are literally behaving like a stenographer. For uh, the the IDF, you are uh, one hundred percent just repeating whatever the fuck the IDF uh, wants you to say. Uh, you delete, you know, you delete war crimes if if they want you to. It's fucking ridiculous, right? You shouldn't even do that for the American military. So the fact that we're like offering these uh, assurances, offering this level of commitment to a foreign military is insane. Okay, like why then don't go there, then don't even fucking film anything, right? Yeah, we had embeds in Iraq, but even then, I think you understand there were plenty of embeds in Iraq that actually unironically did devastating coverage for the Iraqi against the against the Iraqi operation. Okay. There were a shit ton of fucking writers, both in Vietnam and in Iraq, that openly just went against this kind of thing and still wrote uh, a, a lot of pieces. I mean, Generation Kill is the Rolling Stones coverage directly from Operation Iraqi Freedom in the first couple of weeks with the, with the Marine Corps. That's like a real story of a Rolling Stones journalist. Um, it, 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 basically, it basically showed everything. It, it showed what our tax dollars were funding, Right. <sighs> Iraq, not a prison, probably had something to do with that. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm simply stating that, like, there was still 
there was still a there was still a tremendous amount of like puff pieces and like ridiculous coverage that uh, mainstream media engaged in. Obviously, they like championed the war in Iraq. They did that. They they repeated lies that the government told. Uh, and and uh, they have blood on their hands as well. But even then, there was still some kind of coverage that that went against that. Meanwhile, these are assurances that that we shouldn't even be giving to the American military. We're giving it to a foreign military now. What the fuck is going on? And are not permitted to move unaccompanied within the Gaza Strip. As a condition to enter Gaza under IDF escort, outlets have to submit all materials and footage to the Israeli military for review prior to publication. CNN has agreed to these terms in order to provide a limited window into Israel's operations in Gaza. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. To which I responded, I mean, there's no other way they could report from inside Gaza since the IDF is very good at killing journalists, which they have been. They've been killing journalists nonstop. So obviously... You can't have a fucking fixer or a handler or use any of your actual contacts because you think you think CNN doesn't have fucking on the ground contacts in Gaza? Of course they do. Of course they do. Except the IDF has been fucking killing them, ruthlessly slaughtering them and their families, which again should be mentioned every fucking day. Every goddamn day. Only democracy in the Middle East, by the way. Certainly not an apartheid state, by the way. How fucking insane. UN said Israel has set new world records for murdering civilians, children, journalists, and aid workers. Yeah. Because they are doing, they are doing uh, an ethnic cleansing campaign. And that's what they're doing. Um, here's some old CNN footage from the Iraq war. It's the same coverage. This half hour, live from the front lines. What is Saddam thinking? Good evening once again. Today, another apparent Saddam sighting, this time with a twist. He appeared with his two sons, but was it really Saddam or was it an imposter? And when was the tape made? Is it all part of a strategy to keep the regime alive? Also, a lot of the atrocities anticipated at the outset of this war have mostly failed to materialize, at least so far. Does that mean Saddam Hussein is not, not in control? To answer the question, CNN senior political analyst, Bill Schneider is joining us now live. Bill? Well, Wolf, before the war, military analysts made a lot of predictions about what Iraq might do to stop the coalition. But many of them have not happened. Well, why not? Immediately after being attacked, some feared the Iraqi regime might fire missiles at Israel, as it did in 1991, to try to draw Israel into the war. <coughs> it didn't. USA Today <coughs> cited military experts who said the Iraqi army could slow a U.S. advance by blowing up bridges, using refugees to clog roads, and flooding rivers to wash out roads. A dam near Karbala was wired but not demolished. And as for the bridges... The 5th Corps forces were able to seize a bridge intact over the Euphrates River. It was, in fact, rigged for demolition. They were able to remove the demolition, cross the bridge, and continue the attack. In 1991, the Iraqis set the oil fields of Kuwait ablaze. There were a few fires early on, but nothing like the conflagrations of 1991. Everyone expected Iraq to unleash chemical and biological weapons. So far, it hasn't happened. What about Saddam's elite Republican Guard units that were supposed to form a ring of steel around Baghdad? The steel seemed to melt quickly under Allied bombardment. Like, they're literally flexing that they're just ruthlessly fucking owning this, this withered and, and, and much weaker uh, and, and completely and utterly destroyed and humiliated Iraqi military, whatever semblance of the military even exists at that point. Can we give a shout out to Auni Eldus, a uh, kid wanted to be a streamer uh, with over 100k subs. He was only 13 and was killed in an airstrike about a week ago, uh, 10k at the time, and over 1 million now. Don't mean much, but at least his goal was reached. Uh, rest in power, Auni Eldus. This was a sub promo vid. Yeah, I saw. Yeah. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ma'akum a'uni a video jdeed. Okay, akhwa. 
الفيديو هذا فيديو تعريفي هذا كان لازم انزله من زمان بس نزل اليوم حينزل اليوم الخميس 18 8 2022 اوكي يا اخوان تعريف عني انا عون الدوس فلسطيني من غزه العمر 12 سنه إيه هذا هدف القناه طبعا نصل 100000 مشترك و500000 ومليون وباذن الله لل10 مليون وبدعمكم بمحبتكم اوكي طبعا شكرا على 1000 مشترك وبي صال يا Um, he reached 1 million subscribers uh, after he was uh, slaughtered by the Israeli Air Force. So he's presenting himself 12 years. I want to have 100K to 1 million to 10 million. Thanks for the 1,000 subs. Yeah. And his favorite streamer, YouTuber, saw that he DM'd him about his channel. Yeah, I saw that video too. Okay. By the way, all... 3,000 plus children that have been murdered also had dreams. You know what I mean? They all had dreams. They're all human. They all had wants. They all had needs. They all had dreams. And they all had their life cut short. That's the reason why I fucking hate this, like, human shield argument and understand exactly where it comes from. Okay? It comes from the same place that any justification for colonial action comes from. It's the underlying, hidden, incredibly cruel assertion that the enemy is not a human being, but instead something different, something lesser. That's it. And it's not like people hide it. It's not like, it's not like many hide this, this position that they have. It's not hidden at all. It's, it's very obvious. I mean, here, I, I covered this as well. I saw this earlier. Name one thing invented by Palestinians without Googling. You know what? Go ahead and Google. Like, saying that Palestinians have never invented anything. Like, they're, they're stupid. And the, the, the implication that they're like... The hidden implication that they're dumb. Not so hidden, really. Like, they haven't done anything. They've, they've done nothing. They don't deserve anything. Like, of course, like, Israel is the is the dominant force here. Okay. To which I uh, said, so much of the criticism of Palestinian emancipation relies on just being a fucking racist monster in the exact same way people defended other settler colonial projects throughout time. Here's the famous Winston Churchill quote. I do not agree that the dog in a manger has the final right to have to the manger, even though he may have lain there for a very long time. I do not admit that right. I do not admit, for instance, the great wrong has been done to the Red Indians of America or the black people of Australia. I do not admit that a wrong has been done to these people by the fact that a stronger race, a higher grade race, a more, a more worldly wise race, to put it that way, has come in place, has come in and taken their place. Here are some uh, images uh, uh, showcasing Manifest Destiny at the time and the brutality of the savage barbarian Native Americans that wanted to ruthlessly slaughter beautiful, pure, white American settlers. It's not new. It's not new at all. Very old, as a matter of fact. You have to Oh, yeah, no, we're going to talk about this as well. You have to lie, and you can't, you can't ever give up on these lies. You have to consistently make sure that there's a steady flow of information all the way from using passive voice, you know, which leads to headlines like, Gazans say explosion materialized out of nowhere in dense neighborhood that may or may not have killed people or may or may not have led to uh, uh, deaths. And that's like a normal fucking, like in the midst of this ruthless bombing campaign that Israel is engaging in, that is ethnic cleansing, you're fucking looking at this and going, hmm, I wonder how, how did this happen? Like how? Where did the bombs come from? Yeah, the Visegrad 24 is affiliated with the fascist Polish law and order party. I see so many supposed progressive liberals sharing their posts. It's scary. Yeah. Israelis are killed. Palestinians, however, die. 
Even from a cold-blooded sociopathic perspective, imagine how many great scientists, artists, engineers perish in wars like the one in Palestine right now. What is this, Stephen J. Gold, who said, I do not care about the wrinkles in Einstein's brain. I care about how many, uh, how many children that could have been uh, nuclear physicists that perished in fucking sweatshops. It's just like, I don't, I don't think people are, are valuable specifically because they're like brilliant, right? Yeah. How many have died in sweatshops and cotton fields? Exactly. I fought for the IDF in Gaza. It made me fight for peace. Beit Hanun, Gaza, after Israeli bombardment of July uh, 26, 2014. Oh, it's Benzion Sanders. Benzion Sanders is... Uh, the founder of of the uh, Breaking the Silence uh, movement that is IDF veterans who work to end the Israeli occupation. Um, he is uh, someone that I uh, rely on. I think he's great. He is a lot of, uh, you know, this is a multi-pronged, multi-faceted, multi-front information war. So I think that it's very important to have people who are up close and personal with this carnage that have actually that have actually dealt some of this carnage turn around recognize their mistakes and try to uh try to work against to to undo that damage for the rest of their lives and Benzion Sanders is a great example of this to try and make amends for what they've done and there are plenty like him And it's important to hear their voices as well. Oh, before I forget, uh, here is uh, Fareed Zakaria. In 1986, anti-divestment, Fareed Zakaria, 1986, former president of the Yale Political Union, argued that Yale should not divest from its holdings in South Africa. Zakaria spoke at a debate last night between the PU and the Yale Debate Association. Bean Zion? Is that how you say it? Benzion? Bean Zion? Yeah. There you go, man. Uh, my man, hey, if anything, he's consistent. You know who's not consistent? Motherfucking Matt Iglesias. Ed, Ed Ingramentum found Matt Iglesias' piece from 20, uh, 2003 in Israel when he actually went to the West Bank. And this is what he wrote. Looking at the situation in the Middle East, I think the administration has things exactly wrong in trying to solve... The Israel situation is a precursor to moving on Iraq. The only way a negotiated settlement will be possible there is if Arafat feels that his position is weakening. Oh, wait, never mind. Didn't he literally go to the West Bank and say that he was grossed out by it? Someone said he was grossed out by the, 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 the horrific mistreatment of Palestinians there. Maybe he didn't care about it even back then. I know he was like a big pusher of the Iraq war. Anyway, um, the only way negotiated settlement would be possible uh, there is if Arafat feels his position is weakening. Uh, hello, it's 2003. He, his position is gone. The only way for that to happen is for the other Arab leaders to start becoming less supportive of him. The only way for that to happen is for our Arab allies to recognize the U.S., Saudi, U.S., Egyptian, U.S., Qatari, etc. relations are two-way streets, not just an endless dialogue about what we need to do to prop up their regimes. What better way to show that than to go do something they really, really don't know us to do, like, say, invade Iraq. Plus, if we invade Iraq, we can create at least one reasonable regime in the area. If some moderate government gets toppled or just becomes outright hostile, as the worriers always worry, then we can just topple them again and set up some more supportive regimes. That's awesome. I did find Matt writing critically of the Israeli occupation around 2007. Maybe he went in between this piece and 2007. There's a point in time where Matty Iglesias finds humanity for like a brief moment. It, it goes away immediately. I don't know exactly at what point in time he, he actually uh, saw the, the mistreatment and the brutality the Palestinians were subjected to in the West Bank and was grossed out by it. But then he lost it very quickly because there's one thing he loves it's, uh, you know, getting clout and uh, making money. So, you don't give a fuck. And more than 60% think the U.S. should call for a ceasefire. President Biden continues to oppose a ceasefire and has instead called for humanitarian pauses, something American diplomats say is under discussion with Israel. Yeah. 
The same principle behind humanitarian pauses. If you're wondering why humanitarian pause, why not a ceasefire? Uh, the same principle behind that is the exact same reason why certain State Department members have either A, resigned, or literally fucking uh, fed the media quotes to say Israel has no plan in Gaza, which is true. They have no plan in Gaza. They have no future plan in Gaza. They're just doing carnage for the sake of carnage, right? Um, and it's also the same reason why uh, uh, Anthony Blinken at least offered some quotes urging Israel to use smaller bombs. It is because America does not care about the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians, but they do care about the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians getting so far ahead of itself that it actually ends up serving uh, as, a, as a negative PR for the Israeli campaign. That's it. Biden officials uh, voiced new concerns and warnings over Israel's war with Hamas. Administration officials are worried that the president's quick support for Israel after Hamas could backfire. The reason why these articles are being written is because they're trying to say, dog, you can't fucking do this. You can't fucking do this. You can't keep killing this many children and think the world is going to go unnoticed. You are causing so much chaos. You are going to get the entire Muslim world to fucking revolt, okay? Not only does it destabilize all of these nations, it ruins all of the security partnerships that America has, has committed to with the Gulf leaders because the Gulf leaders can't forever, uh, you know, squash their own protests internally. It's like, at the end of the day, no matter how authoritarian Gulf regimes might be, you're going to fuck up. Like, they can't fucking control uh, that crowd if they, if they get completely unruly and completely out of, uh, out of control. They know that they have to play this delicate song and dance where they want to maintain their position. They want to keep being cucked to America. They want to keep normalizing relations with Israel on paper, okay? They like the steady flow of American weapons coming in. The problem is, however that the, the, the Gulf nations and the population there have dramatically different opinions on what's going on in Israel than the way that the Gulf leaders behave. Don't say Gulf leaders have cultish citizens. That's not true. You're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the populations see what America is doing. The population see what America is doing. The population sees... Uh, they, they see what Israel is doing as an expression, as an American imperialist expression, which it is, and they get very fucking mad. It's only how far, how far the, the leadership can, like, toe the line. Okay? The reality, of course, is that, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia doesn't give a fuck about its own citizens or whatnot, but... They do give a fuck about riots because there's only so much you can do to control your own population. And when they fucking get so mad and they realize that you're not actually representing what they want, they're going to fucking riot. This is precisely the reason why. This is precisely the reason why they have to play this song and dance where they're like, all right, we'll just wait. We'll just wait. We'll just... We'll just block and we'll push and we'll wait and we'll quietly help Israel. We'll quietly help America, but we can't, you know, but we're not going to, uh, you know, we're not going to, we're not, we're not going to make a big fuss about it. Maybe like Erdogan, for example, we'll come out and we'll say some like real aggressive shit about Israel every now and then while also quietly making assurances to the United States of America that like the, the, um, the campaign to normalize relations with Israel will continue. Erdogan is a great example of this as well. He's not a Gulf leader, right? You're kind of wrong, Hassan. The Gulf states are brutal to their citizens. It's really hard to get them to riot. Brother, you know what, you know what other country is really brutal to their citizens and, and will squash protests, okay, with dramatic efficiency? China. Guess what happened in China? The dam broke. When, it, when the COVID, zero COVID policies got way out of hand, guess what happened? The people fucking revolted. 
And the, the government had to respond to those revolts by listening to their demands and changing the zero COVID policy. That's, I'm telling you, you guys do not understand if you think that, that uh, these guys can maintain their positions without people losing their fucking minds and rioting. Okay? The reality is that these Gulf nations... These Gulf nations, their leadership at least, have been normalizing relations with Israel for some time now. This is not a new thing. It's just that on paper, they were normalizing relations. That part was new. The Abraham Accords basically was supposed to solidify. Um, the Abraham Accords was basically supposed to solidify the relationship with Israel. Okay? Okay. Never forget, you cannot break the will of the people, okay? That's why neoliberal mechanisms of control are so powerful, because it makes you feel like you have liberty, okay? Rather than an authoritarian government that openly says, like, we're authoritarian. And the only way to revolt against an author the only way to push back against an authoritarian government is by revolution or by revolt, Okay? That's it. Agreed. So remember, we outnumber your mods 1,000 to 1. Suck my dick. Shut up, bitch. Take a day off. I have to disagree here. In UAE, when I lived there, Arabs who are not local are scared from deportation for speaking out, which happens a lot. Local people usually support whatever their government does, no matter what, because it benefits them, and they're very well off. I mean, there's certainly... There's certainly support as well. That's part of the reason why they can do this broad mandate to normalize relations with Israel. But what you have to remember is it's very different when Israel has killed 10,000 Palestinians. Okay? Do you understand? Like, it's only, it's only so much ruthless, indiscriminate violence that... Uh, that is an expression of Western imperialism uh, that that the Muslim world will withstand. There's also other aspects of this, like Jerusalem and its importance to the to the uh, Muslim world in general. There were points of contention within Jerusalem, like Israel wanted to completely capture Jerusalem. It's a uh, contested territory. It's occupied by Israel right now, right? And they wanted to solidify. Uh, their their control over Jerusalem, to which Arafat time and time again said he was completely unable to do so. He was not able to offer Israel complete control over Jerusalem because there are symbolic uh, uh, ways in which the Arab world and the Muslim world in general will also retaliate violently uh, towards uh, these kinds of decisions. Arafat does not have unilateral decision-making capacity on the issue of Jerusalem, for example. He can't do it. These are these are the other these are the other like uh these are places that have symbolic importance, and of course they're going to, uh, uh, like no matter what happens, like even if people normally don't care, even if members of Gulf nation states normally don't fucking care in general, they're like yeah whatever Palestinians are getting fucked over, but like I think it's better to like deal with America and Israel. It'll give us prosperity. There's only so much violence that they will put up with. Now, regardless, regardless, uh, ultimately, the, the main actors here that are ruining all of this is Israel. They are far too horny to do indiscriminate violence, okay? They're far too fucking horny to engage in indiscriminate violence. When you do that, people will respond. People in America who have... Uh, who have for a very long time turned a blind eye to these atrocities and the apartheid regime are responding in the way that I've never seen. I've never seen this kind of response. What is this? I think you're mildly confused on not only the brutality of the Gulf states stops revolting, there is also Zionist propaganda from the Gulf states' leaders to the citizens. I'm telling you, man, if that was simply the case, then they would just go, all right, that's it. Uh, we don't give a fuck what uh, you're saying about Israel. We're still going to fucking deal with Israel. We're still going to normalize relations with Israel. Why have they had to only normalize relations with Israel, not on paper, but behind closed doors? 
You're wrong. You're, you're, you're wrong. You're not right. You're wrong on this. Anyway. Mr. President, any progress on the humanitarian pause? Yes. Biden wasn't in Washington on Saturday to see the protest for himself. But demonstrators say, all the same, he cannot be blind or deaf to their anger. The heads of 18 all right, let's do a paradigm United changing Nations moment. agencies and NGOs have issued a rare joint statement calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, expressing shock and horror FTP. at Israel's month-long bombardment. The statement read in part, quote, we need an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. It's been 30 days. Enough is enough. This must stop now, unquote. But Israel's rejecting all calls for a ceasefire, or even a humanitarian pause, as the Palestinian death toll in Gaza and the West Bank nears 10,000 over this past month. U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken's continuing a trip throughout the Middle East. Blinken's in Turkey today after stops in Tel Aviv, Ramallah, Jordan and Iraq. This comes as fears grow of a broader regional war. On Sunday, an Israeli strike on a car in southern Lebanon killed three children and their grandmother. The strike came two days after Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah gave a major address. We begin today's show looking at diplomatic efforts to halt Israel's bombardment, which began October 7th. After Hamas launched a surprise attack that Israel says killed over 1,400 people. Israel says about 240 hostages were taken during the attack. We're joined by Shibli Talhami, professor of peace and development at the University of Maryland, also a senior fellow at the Center for Middle East Policy. He's co-editor of the book, The One State Reality, What is Israel-Palestine? Professor Talhami, welcome back to Democracy Now! Can you start off by talking about this Horrifying landmark moment. Nearly 10,000 Palestinians have been killed. Mass protests around the world. Uh, Secretary of State Blinken uh, going to Tel Aviv, then surprising people by going to Ramallah, went to Jordan, met with Arab leaders, then on to Iraq. The significance of that now in Turkey. What you feel needs to happen now? Well, first of all, in terms of this moment, which you asked about, obviously, um, anyone with a heart, it doesn't matter whether you are Jewish or Arab or, or Christian or whatever, uh, the scale of horror is just unbearable. And we haven't seen that in uh, uh, certainly years, but perhaps decades uh, in the Israeli-Palestinian uh, arena. But I think uh, it's even bigger than that. It's beyond the, the humanitarian heartache that we all witness uh, every day. And we have witnessed also in that attack on, on Israel. Um, I think it is, um, you know, those people who think this is just another cycle of violence are really not captured in the moment. This is a paradigm changing moment. Uh, this is a moment that's likely to really shift the way we think about the conflict. It is likely to shift the way people in the region think about the United States because of its role. Uh, and I think, therefore, even people who are thinking about, let's think about the morning after, are not coming to groups with what a morning after might look like if there is a morning after. Uh, so I think it's a moment uh, that is bigger than most of us realize, because those moments in history usually are evaluated after the fact, not while you're going through it. We know it's horrendous but we're not grasping the implications. Let's talk about President Biden right now. Um, uh, polls show that um, before all of this took place, I mean, when he was elected, he had something like 59 percent of the Arab American vote. We're now talking about something like 17 percent. And we're talking about key states like Michigan, um, Dearborn, for example. Can you talk about the significance of this nationally and then globally where he stands um, in the Arab world? Yeah, I think nationally, obviously, we, we already see, um, uh, uh, you know, implications of this. We see it in various polling that has been, been taken. Um, the, his popularity had dropped. Uh, among Democrats, coincidentally, around the same time. Her period is causing her to piss way more frequently, it seems. Something that I did not consider. Sorry. Just like you guys didn't consider the top of the hour ad break coming. Uh, she's not fixed yet. No. Just like you do not consider the top of the hour ad break coming at the top of every hour. Hello. No, 
doggy diapers is not good. We don't want her to piss. Uh, we don't want her to get comfy. I will fix her, yes. Um, here's the three minute handbrake now, which you can fix by subscribing for five dollars or for free. Here's the three minute handbrake now. Time uh, that this war. Um, uh, I'm genuinely confused about something. How can the death count be so low? They've literally dropped more bombs on Gaza than they've killed people. Um, part of it is because they tell people to leave. That's that's it. That is lit that is true. Like, it it's still a fucking war crime because they are hitting civilian targets. But yeah, there's also a, a, a shit ton of people under the rubble. These are just the confirmed deaths. But, uh, yeah. Um, also, the IDF claims 20,000 have died. Uh, according to this Ynet Alerts post, which I was trying to make sense of, a senior security official said 20,000 were killed by IDF attacks in Gaza, most of them terrorists, which is... The, the most of them terrorist part is just fucking a complete falsehood. What do you, what do you mean? 30K plus in one month is low? No, the amount... In comparison, the amount of fucking in comparison to the amount of bombs that they've dropped, uh, there are around 2,000 plus people that are under the rubble. The number of injured is also incredibly high, yes. If 20K Hamas died, Hamas would have been no longer. Yes, I know. Which is why they should stop, right? Like, they should stop the bombing, right? I thought they killed 20,000... Hamas terrorists, so they must have they must be done, right? Except no, they're not, because I don't believe those numbers are correct. <laughs> How could they be? It started and, and is going on, and we don't know that that's directly related. Low? Low? Yes, low in comparison to how many bombs have been dropped. What the fuck are you talking about? The number is not actually low. No one would make this argument. I certainly would never make an argument like this. I've been covering this nonstop. Oh. Get to it, but it perhaps it is. Uh, but I have um, conducted a poll uh, through our University of Maryland critical issues poll uh, two weeks after the war. And there was a bump in the sympathy for Israel. But when it comes to the Biden administration's evaluation, more people said he was too pro-Israel than said he is uh, 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 too pro-Palestinian. And obviously, in terms of the implications for voting, we asked, are you more likely to vote uh, for uh, President Biden because of his stance on the Israeli-Palestinian issue? We have far more people saying they're less likely to vote for him than more likely to vote for him. So it has implications way beyond Arab and Muslim Americans, because our poll cannot possibly capture uh, Arab and Muslim Americans in, uh, in, in the sample. Uh, but we do know that in the sample, in, in based on uh, you know uh, reporting and other polls that have been done, uh, Arab and Muslim Americans are extremely frustrated. I know definitely that some of the Arab American leaders have conveyed to the Secretary of State directly that the president is likely to lose Michigan because of his stance. So I think the president, um, uh, I, my own view is this war is going to hurt him. But globally, it's also going to hurt him a lot uh, because I think people can't, uh, people understood his support for Israel after the horrific Hamas attack. What they can't understand uh, is his inability uh, to condemn the actions that have resulted in such mass destruction and killing uh, in Gaza. Uh, and. Uh, why is Hassan aggressive always and disrespectful to people when they put in a view that's separate from his? Doesn't make sense, seeing as you can obviously tell this man is intelligent. First of all, I'm not. I'm a dumbass. Secondly, um, tensions would be high for you as well if you also personally saw each individual death as like a real human being. Obviously, when I, when I am describing... 3,000 children being ruthlessly slaughtered over the course of the past 30 days of nonstop bombing. And I say, please, we have to stop these bombing campaigns. And someone goes in and says, well, um, I don't know if I want to believe that 3,000, almost 4,000 children have been uh, ruthlessly slaughtered. It's just, it's not just like a, like a different opinion. That's a gross opinion. Ultimately, it comes down to 
ultimately it comes down to do you think what's going on is ethnic cleansing or not? If you think it's ethnic cleansing, then you have to stand against it. I'm Jewish, and I've literally had to keep my mouth shut because even when I suggest that Israeli response is unnecessarily killing and punishing Palestinians who had nothing to do with the terror attacks, I get accused of not caring about the Israeli people who died. Yeah. Um, it also it also is, like, ridiculous because... It, it's additionally ridiculous because it's not, like... If your goal is to end this violence, if you're, like, actually interested in a permanent security assurance... For Israeli citizens, right? If that's your only goal, if your only goal is self-interest, you have to understand there is no other way of, of getting permanent security in this circumstance by repeating the same idiotic, nonsensical, and violent actions over and over again. It's ethnic cleansing. It's an, it's an apartheid ethnostate engaging in an act of ethnic cleansing in an occupied territory Okay. It is one of the <laughs> the most unjustifiable things. So Yeah, I get a little passionate. I'm sorry. I apologize if I've like yelled at someone uh and 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 people maybe thought that that was like uh not great. Apologies, but I but yeah, I I get heated because I think this is an important issue. And it's one that makes me feel like I'm insane because the more I cover it, the more I, the more I see the atrocities, the more I see uh, America's lack of interest in stopping it, even though we play a very significant role, the more I lose my mind a little bit. Like, how do you not, how are people who I otherwise would consider maybe even empathetic or progressive coming in here to say such incredibly awful things? Such unprogressive things. Stop saying Gulf states. What do you mean UAE and Saudi Arabia, Qatar and Kuwait have massive daily protests are covered and supported by the governments? They've always been way less brutal to any protest compared to the U.S. Sure. I will try to do a heat check and maintain a, a, a less angry tone. Um, his, um, you know, seeming complicity in that. And that's, that's really something that goes against... Um, the um uh, you know the, the would after the uh soviet uh, uh, sorry the russian uh, invasion of ukraine uh we know that he tried to defend uh, a liberal uh, the, the notion of a liberal and international order and certainly a a um, uh you know a uh, uh, rules based international order uh, and uh opposed in principle uh targeting civilians or recklessly endangering them and and war crimes and what we see he's not able to do that uh with regard to gaza i think this is going to undermine his uh, standing globally not just uh in the in the middle east not just in the global south but beyond you also said in a recent interview there's a level of shock you haven't seen even during the iraq war that you'd bet biden today might even supersede benjamin Net netanyahu as the most disliked leader in the arab world professor talhami uh, yes, and, and as you know, you know, I have, um, you know, I, I was, I took a position um, against the Iraq War um, uh, in in 2002 um, when people were talking about it uh, to the point that um, I helped organize a, a uh, an ad for international relations scholar in the New York Times, September 2002, saying the Iraq War is not in America's national interest. Uh, it was hard for us to break through an empty war. Question: Why are India so horny for Israel? Um... Uh, uh, how many, I mean, how much time you got? Uh, there, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of Indians have a very important shared perspective with a lot of Israelis, you know, far from every single person, but there's definitely big majorities there that just despise Muslims in general. It's Islamophobia, which is a, is a giant, uh, uniting factor. Also, I would say Israel is fascist, and so is India. Like, the Indian governance, BJP, is fascist. The Israeli, the, the Israeli coalition government also is fascist, an apartheid state. 
Yeah, but of course there are still... Listen, listen. Motherfucker, there are over one billion of us, including many communists. We aren't all BJP, Israel, ball polishers. I'm not talking about... I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what you see online. Someone asked, why are people so horny in India for Israel? It's really funny, though, because, like, there is a level of, like... There is a level of racism in Israel, too. It, obviously, Israel is incredibly diverse from a racial perspective in the way that you understand like American white supremacy and American racial boundaries, you will, you will lose sight of uh, Israeli politics. If you, if you think about it from that point of view, like, Oh, like Israelis are all white. They're not, they want to be, but they're not. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and the most, uh, the most like ruthless, the most militant factions within Israel are always, uh, or at least historically and certainly in contemporary Israeli society have been Arab Jews themselves as a consequence of the integration uh, policies who they who still see themselves as like uh, supremacists, like above uh, the, the Arab Muslims and Christians. And, uh, and, and therefore, a lot of those guys also look at like Indians as, as lesser than as well, despite the fact that Indian Twitter... And, and Hindu nationalists love, fucking love Israel because they feel like they have a united enemy. Message through the, uh, the regular media. Uh, and at that time, I also conducted a poll in the, in the Arab world that showed that... China does Muslim segregation too, if I'm not mistaken. No, they do have Uyghur segregation, not Muslim segregation. There's other Muslims in China that have not had to withstand the crippling surveillance state and re-education camps that Uyghurs had to go through, 100%. Damn, this guy's good.